You know, there are times when I say, hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, and you just don't sound very enthusiastic in your thanks be to God. So I, I wonder why on this one. This is, you know, I, 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 this is my fourth Sunday back, and there have been difficult texts in each one of the readings. So for those of you who were not on sabbatical, God bless you for living through other difficult texts. Uh, and, and here we step into this one. I want to say that this text on divorce and all of the implications and, and struggles that happen around divorce have literally touched each of our lives in some way or another. And so there, we listen carefully to what this has to say, and I hope um, I can bring some hope to you in this text today. Let's see what happens. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Being married to Job could not have been easy. It meant that you would be collateral damage in the battle between God and Satan focused on your husband. In today's passage, we get a first glance of how intense this battle between the adversary of God and God's most faithful servant will soon become. Satan is all about persecuting Job. In case you missed the point of this book, I'll say it again. Satan is all about persecuting Job. He's going to flatten him. He intends to turn him and everyone and everything that Job loves into a pancake and serve them for breakfast in the cosmic battle of the ages. Satan tells God that he will torment this righteous man until his suffering is so palpable, everyone will know it. And he is not messing around. The reading of this lection actually makes your skin crawl. Mrs. Job is a witness, and she's a sideway sufferer in all the afflictions cast upon her husband. She advises her husband to take a stand, a defiant stand against God. And if we just heard what was read by Jim, she said, curse God and then die. It's like, I don't know if I'd want to stay with her much longer if that's her solution to any conflict. You curse God and you die, right? Oh, well, that's what will happen, right? In the book of Job, we never hear her name. But a very important Jewish document called the Testament of Job, dating back to the first century before the Common Era, so 2,100 years ago, refers to her as Sittus. For generations, the pious Jewish scribes would not print her name or what she said. Instead of curse God, they actually wrote the words bless God in the Hebrew text because they couldn't bring themselves to put cursing God on the breath of Job or his wife or the pages of scripture. Our translation today is the correct translation. It took all the way to the new revised standard version to translate this publicly for us to know that it says curse God. They believed to curse God would not only violate the third commandment, but it would rupture Job's basic attitude of trust in God and the qualities of goodness that he'd shown all people throughout his life. But Sidus was not where Job was in relation to being a suffering servant. This wasn't her gig. Job won't abide with Sidus's attitude. And by the way, for such a righteous man, he talks down to his wife, and I don't like that at all. It reminds her that we must all experience many things from the hands of God, from the hand of God, some positive and some negative. As his skin is literally crawling in pain, and Sidus is watching this in pain, Job stays strong. We are only in the first chapter of what will become 40 more chapters of misery. Through it all, Job will not abandon his trust in God. He will not give in to the torture of Satan and even the questioning of his spouse 
about God and about himself. I have a lot of compassion for both Job and Sittus in this early section of what we'll return to in the readings of the coming weeks as well. In the interplay of love and marriage placed on the big stage of a battle between God and Satan, Job is the object lesson and Sittus is caught, caught in the crossfire. We can relate to her. In the crossfire, we all experience the hardships of relationships and the suffering that goes with it. While we might be willing to take on the challenges that come directly at us, that come our way, it hurts badly and deeply when we look into the eyes of the ones that we love and see their pain and all they're struggling with. It doubles down on us and kills us sometimes. It is in the crossfire that I find relationships and marriages are made or broken. They either succeed or fail in these moments. When we come into marriage, we're not really paying attention when we're saying all those words at the altar. I don't know about you, but I really wasn't paying attention that day. We say all these things, we make all these promises for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. But when we're standing there, we're not really thinking about that. We're thinking, we, uh, it's like we hear these words, richer, health, better, right? <laughs> we don't hear the other part. Perhaps that's why we find ourselves caught so often in the struggles of relationship, realizing that the worst, the poorer, and the sickness are also part of the deal. And they're hard to face. Both Job and Sidus are challenged to the max. And that much we can guarantee. And then we turn to Mark, which doesn't relieve the pressure. It just turns into a different crossfire, if you will. The Pharisees are trying to get Jesus to talk about divorce. Jesus wants to talk about marriage. Although divorce was not a debatable question among the Jews of Jesus' time, the allowable grounds for divorce was a very hot topic. I know you've studied all the hot topics of the first century AD, but this was a hot one in case you missed it. The Pharisees want to know, will Jesus stand with the traditional hardliners and speak strongly and clearly and damn those who are going through divorce? Or will he hang out with Hillel and all those permissible liberals and go with the other understanding that it's all right, everything's fine? They want to pin him down. They want to know where he stands on the law, and they want Jesus to affirm their lifelong belief that two people can only be joined together in a profound and meaningful love and union that lasts forever, and that's the end. Jesus is very interested in this love and union part. He wants to focus on the gifts of God's creation and relationships. Rather than focusing on the sweeping legal prohibitions, he wants to focus on the goodness that is between two people, both those in marriages that succeed and the people that don't make it in marriage. He's not interested in putting anyone in the damnable pile. In other words, while the Pharisees want him to speak out about divorce, he sees them as the problem. They're the ones whose hearts are hardening. And that's why these laws were made in the first place, for people who can't deal with it. Jesus really wants to take a stand for marriage and the blessing of relationships that hold two people together. And I would say at this point in human history, we have a very beautiful and wide-reaching understanding of what marriage is. We've grown, we've grown a lot, but divorce still hangs out there, doesn't it? It still is this thing. I've preached about divorce a number of times through the years. It's really tough because the Bible truly wrestles in a lot of places with texts around divorce. It just does. And I'm convinced, I've said this in long sermons about divorce, some of you have suffered through, but I, I'm convinced that God is struggling all the way through the scriptures with the, you know, the same thing we struggle with, and that is we want this to be for good. We want it to last forever. But sometimes it doesn't. So what do you do when it doesn't? 
And so God is in that midst of the struggle too. You see it, you feel the angst in the texts around divorce. But anyway, there had been um, this one couple that I worked with many, many years ago at my old church. They came to me and they said, um, you know, we're really struggling. We want you to basically fix our marriage. And so I worked with them for a little while. And then one day they called me and very angrily said to me, you told us that only God can save our marriage, so we're not coming back to you anymore. Well, there had been infidelity by the husband, harsh unkindness, abusive words exchanged, and who knows what more. There was a deep fault line of broken trust between the two of them. And I said to them, actually what I told you was this, that you have not once in your marriage asked for God's help. You've not once looked at me in all our time together and asked to for, uh, for forgiveness or trying to work out a better way. You've not once looked with kindness on each other. And what I said to you was, if you don't seek any help from God, you can't find any help from human sources either. You need both. They blame me for bad counseling, which is fair. I mean, I've been blamed for that before. But shortly after that, they left one another, and they were angry at me, but they left one another angrier still. You see, Jesus knows that family matters are so important to all of us. He knows that they matter deeply to us. He also knows that we often lose sight of the children in the midst of all that goes on in the crossfire of adult behaviors. There's no mistaking what Jesus does next. I think this is one of the most significant moments in scriptural history. He turns his back on the Pharisees and on the disciples and sees the kids. He looks away from those who want to pin him down on legality around divorce and he sees the children. He sees them close at hand. And the next thing we know is he's blessing them and he's offering them his love, his anointing, if you will. The disciples can't see this. The Pharisees can't see this. But Jesus knows this is a family matter too. The most important ones are right here in front of us, our kids. As much as Sittis feels caught in the crossfire of the battle between Satan and God, just focused on Job, the children of our world are too often caught in the crossfire between adults who can't and won't work things out. Jesus knows this. That's why as the conversation with the Pharisees spin into a downward spiral, he holds the moment and he calls everyone to accept the kingdom of God like a child. Kids have no status in Jesus's world, right? They have no rights, they're powerless, they're vulnerable, they're little people who often get deemed a nuisance by big people. By buying into this narrative of society's devaluation of children, the disciples who push them away have failed to see what Jesus is really about. He's really about the children. They have missed what he means when he talks about the special blessing of kids. They receive God with openness and honesty and curiosity and clearness. They ask the questions that nobody else asks, and they do it with grace, and they do it with love. They model for us what this looks like. They don't make excuses. They don't angle for better deals. They don't get tripped up with resentments and anger. That comes along a little later. But at least at this point, these kids are just who they are. In these difficult texts that deal with family matters today, I ask us to remember who we are and to whom we belong. Because we're children too. Every single one of us in here is a child as well. We are children of a living and loving God. And as children of God, we would all do well to come to God in openness and honesty and curiosity and clearness rather than get all bound up in our issues and walk away. On this World Communion Sunday, Jesus is calling 2.4 billion Christians to his table. As we turn 
let us remember to be a family in all of this. Let us hold on to each other no matter what has caused splits or divisions in our own families, in this family, whatever it is. We have to follow what he tells us to do and welcome God's kingdom like a child. And I bring to you these words as we come to the table today from our sisters and brothers in Iona, Scotland. Listen to these words that they offer as practical instructions as we come to the table. In the Gospels, they say, Jesus was always the guest. In the homes of Peter and Jarius, Martha and Mary, Joanna and Susanna, he was always the guest. At the meal tables of the wealthy, where he pled the case for the poor, he was always the guest. Upsetting polite company, befriending isolated people, welcoming the stranger, he was always the guest. But here, at this table, Jesus is the host. Those who wish to serve him must first be served by him. Those who want to follow him must first be fed from his hand. Those who would wash his feet must first let him make them clean. For this is the table where God intends us to be nourished. This is the time when Christ can make us new. So come, you who hunger and thirst for a deeper faith, for a fuller life, for a better world. Jesus Christ, who has sat at our tables, invites us now to be a guest at his. Let us remember to work out our family members or matters with love and grace as guests at his table. Amen.